More than one in three people will face cancer in their lifetime. Unfortunately, fear can stop you from getting cancer screening, but it won't stop cancer. Early detection can save your life. Don't wait for symptoms to appear to act. Cancer screening is safe, effective, and accessible for everyone, including free or low-cost screening programs. Go to cancerscreenquiz.com now and take the American Cancer Society's two-minute cancer screening quiz to find out what screening tests are right for you. Don't wait. Take the quiz. Get screened. Go to cancerscreenquiz.com now. Cancer Screen Quiz. Com. Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. Today we have an introduction to ISKCON with a close look at other movements and spirituality and how branches of sects can exist and exploit within branches of sects that already exist. Before we get started we have the usual housekeeping. CrimeCon, partnered with CBS Reality, is fast approaching. Taking place on June 11th and 12th in London, come and meet police dogs, take part in forensic workshops, attend panels with journalists, private investigators and victims' families, as well as attending live podcast shows and hang out with all of us in the hotel bar at the end of the day. For 10% off tickets, visit crimecon.co.uk and use the word cult at the checkout or follow the link in the episode description. Also, don't forget you can be in with a chance of winning copies of Zach Bonney's book, Dead Insane or in Jail, and his second book, Overwritten, by interacting on my social media pages. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Cult Vault Pod. The Cult Vault shop is now open with t-shirts, hoodies, stickers, mugs, bookmarks, and now badges. You can find the shop at cultvaultpodcast.com forward slash shop or use the link in the episode description. If you have someone special in your life who deserves recognition for helping you through tough times, you can now vote for them in the Ally Awards on my website. And of course, if you'd like to support the show, you can find me at patreon.com forward slash the cult vault and sponsor the show for as little as £1 a month, which gives you access to a 15% discount on all merchandise and also access to exclusive episodes and content. Now, 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 all that aside, let's get on with the show. A quick disclaimer before we start, I do not personally support people attempting to join cults or high demand groups for personal or social experimentation. And I also do not hold the belief or perception that high control groups or cults are inherently good. I believe aspects of them can be, but as discussed in this episode, the manipulation, exploitation and damage to personal mental health is not worth the risk. So please do be careful. Of course, I will not always agree with everything that every guest says on the show, but I am mindful and respectful that they hold their own beliefs and opinions. Also, I apologise for some of the audio quality ahead, but here is Michael to talk us through his experiences with the Hare Krishna movement. Hello, Michael, and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me today. This is going to be the first interview with someone who has experienced being a member of ISCON. So I am really ready to learn more. Would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners? Hi, Casey. See, I'm Michael. I am 29 years old and I was part of the Hare Krishna cult slash religion um, between November 2020 and March 2021. Uh, I have always been interested in religion and religious movements as well as philosophy, especially Eastern philosophy and mysticism. So I was drawn into the Hare Krishna religion uh, initially due to those interests uh, that I had in mysticism. I had explored Buddhism since I was in the 11th grade. I wanted to become a monk as a child. Uh, before I graduated in the um, before I graduated in uh, the twelfth year level, my thought process was I wasn't interested in you know the rat race and achieving a high score, uh, which they called the ATAR score, so a high ATAR score, and uh, making a lot of money and focusing my life on material achievements. Since I was young, like I was always interested in those philosophical, deeper meaning of life and the nature of existence kind of questions and pursuing deeper, deeper practices and a deeper path, a spiritual path. Do you know where those interests 
come from because that it's not I, I, I don't think it's a typical interest for somebody as young as as 11 years of age to kind of know that that's something that they wanted to pursue something that they were interested in is it influenced by your parents or is it just something you you kind of picked up and realized you you really had a deep interest in um it was in the 11th uh, year so uh when I was in the 11th grade uh sorry so it, but even before that, so I would say like when I was 16 and when I went to Vietnam a few times, I was already interested in looking at um, reading the books that they had at the temple. I was, I can't remember how old I was when I started becoming a um, Buddhist vegetarian, which includes not eating any onion or garlic because it, because it's considered to raise your sexual appetites so people don't consume that and I was following this I was doing meditation and attending their the youth groups um when I went to Vietnam I would go to the temple as a teenager and I went to the temple regularly on Sundays in Australia uh, my parents were not really religious they followed traditions uh like they were Buddhist, nominal Buddhist, so they were born into more of a cultural practice and tradition, but they didn't really deeply follow any religious beliefs. And uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, he was a Khao Dai monk. A Khao Dai is a syncretistic religion in Vietnam that has influences from spiritualism, seances, uh, French culture, Victor Hugo, Catholicism, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism. So there may be like a genetic link. I never remember meeting my grandfather. I, only, I met him when I was a baby, so I can't recall those memories. But I have a sense that there could be like a genetic uh, hereditary reason for my interest in religion because nobody in my family has this interest. Nobody is, um, you know, reading books on psychoanalysis and studying Jung and Freud and Marcus Aurelius. My dad's a carpet layer. My mum's, she works, I don't know, she's a homemaker. She lives with my dad and my sister's an accountant, a chartered accountant who worked for Toyota and she's, um, she was married and she's getting remarried and she's got a kid. So no one in my family has those same interests or even the same questions that I had about life and the meaning and pursuing something different than just a picket fence kind of existence, the stereotypical American dream, Australian dream, or whichever country you come from dream. Yeah. When you would go to Temple, would you go on, on your own then uh, when you were a teenager? Yeah, I quite enjoyed going on my own because I would collect books. I would... Uh, eat the food that I wanted to eat because they they did free um free vegetarian meals every Sunday and they also had paid meals that you could if you wanted to buy chips for example you get chips but some days they would have vegetarian pho the Vietnamese noodle soup uh, beef noodle soup but no like with the meat replacement and they would have traditional Vietnamese food there but done vegetarian and I liked that more than actual Vietnamese food sometimes because the way that um, the vegetarian uh, chefs would prepare, like the Buddhist cuisine, Vietnamese Buddhist cuisine, it was very, it was flavoured very differently. It was like a unique kind of cuisine of its own. Um, I th like with the Hare Krishna, it's the same thing. Like they have their own kind of unique, you know, vegetarian lasagnas and mix and, you know, curries and kind of thing. People love their food, actually. Yeah, well, both the Buddhist food and then the, the Krishna food. And for those who haven't heard of ISKCON before, what does that stand for? The International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Um, it's a movement started by a Indian Swami named uh, Swami Prabhupada. That's his, um, the name that was like an honorific name that was given to him. And he came to the US in the late 60s he brought a devotional religion to the hippies um, based on monotheism 
and devotion to Krishna, who they consider the creator and the source of all avatars and existence. Uh, it's quite different to other beliefs in Hinduism and Indian philosophy. It's um, they don't believe in monism that everything is God, uh, and that the soul and the uh, the individual is God. They are absolutely against that. So that's um, Advaita Vedanta philosophy. They don't accept that, and they don't accept. Um, they don't accept any supremacy of Shiva being God, the ultimate God, or Shak Shakti or Devi, who's the female energy. They believe that everything is subordinated to Krishna in their specific v variety of um, Hinduism, which they call Gaudiya. Their specific sect is called Gaudiya Vaishnavism. It's much more organized than... I guess um, other kind of religious practices in um, in India in Hinduism because usually you get you do get uh, sects which are called sampradayas that have a guru and a lineage and a, a dogma, but then you also have people who just practice worship at home and they have what you call an ishta deva or a kula deva. Kula is family, so. Um, a deity that they worship because their family worshipped or a deity in addition to that that they worship personally because it's their chosen favourite deity. And uh, so ISKCON provides a lot more structure in comparison to what someone who would just be like a nominal Hindu would practice. Right, right, uh, okay. Yeah. And... It's my understanding that because of the different belief system that ISKCON has adopted, they are quite controversial in the realm of Buddhism. Um, so they disagree with Buddhism in their Sanskrit slash Bengali hymns that they sing in the month, like their songs that they sing at 7 a.m. Or sometimes six, uh, five thirty. It depends uh, when they, when it starts at the temple, or at someone's house. The lyrics are, um, you know, Nirvishesha Shunyavari Paschacha Deshatarine, and it's it's. I think Prabhupada wrote this, and it it means something along the lines of let uh, let our guru help this world from impersonalism and voidism and those terms um, impersonalism and voidism is shunyavadi nirvishesha uh, which is a sanskrit word and it's referring to the philosophies of buddhism and advaita vedanta so shunya is the the emptiness of buddhism the, that philosophy and nirvishesha is the philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. So they believe that their guru is saving the world from these philosophies uh, in, that, in that particular song, but he's also uh, assisting people to develop devotion for Krishna. So there's a lot of things that he's come in to save the Western world from, according and to their belief system. I suppose in some ways that might be where some people get confused because you have the, the the worship of Krishna, but you also have the worship of the man who founded the Hare Krishna movement. So it's often confusing at times knowing which person to worship because some of the footage I've seen, some of the articles I've read suggest that Propupad, he's the one who is often worshipped from, from things I've seen. I don't know if you think that, that that's accurate at all. Um, I find it challenging to uh, use certain terms, like I'm not sure worship or veneration, but I would say they have a deep respect for him and they venerate him and they 
um, they treat him as a representative, a pure devotee, which is one of the highest states that a human can reach in the uh, in on Earth. So they believe he is a representative of Krishna, a Shakti Avash avatar, a, a, a someone that Krishna Krishna has invest uh, put his energy into, but they're not Krishna themselves. It's just someone that is embodying the the energy of Krishna. So Prabhupada is one of these high status people who has come to bring a purified version of devotional worship to Krishna. And so when people are worshiping uh, Prabhupada or when they're venerating Krishna, they're venerating the teachings and the purity of those teachings and the, the purity of his character. So everything that he says is to be taken into account seriously and 100% with absolute belief and faith and conviction. So he's kind of like, it's similar to in Catholicism how they have a Pope. Mm -hmm. So he would be kind of like the Pope version the the Gaudiya Vaishnava version of a pope. Okay. Um, I think that's. And then a... obviously there were people before Prabhupada, but the the latest pope, I would like the latest representative, the final one. Um, I, they they do believe that there will be a future person who renews or renovates the um, Gaudiya Vaishnava religion, but their final representative is like. Prabhupada. It's like how in Islam they consider Muhammad to be the final representative or with uh, like the example I just mentioned with Catholicism, how the Pope is the living representative um, that, is, does, that is to be venerated and honoured and loved and you, know, un- you can't question them because they're so perfect and chosen by God, like the chosen one. Yeah. Those comparisons definitely make it easier for me in my mind to to understand where Prabhupada stands within the the ISKCON movement and the word veneration I think is is quite interesting as well so it, it's not so much that people are are worshipping him as they would Krishna but they are venerating him and using him as an example of what to reach for it within your journey, your personal journey within the Krishna movement, that that is the ideal version of commitment to Krishna is Prabhupada. And, and so he is kind of an example of what to strive for in terms of purity and closeness to Krishna. And they also believe that his teachings are final so if someone from the same uh, Gaudiya Vaishnava religion but from a different uh, lineage, like Gaudiya Mutt, for example, if they come in and say, you're doing it wrong, we believe in 64, uh, 64 rounds of chanting, you're only doing 16, which is a true thing for them, or we can't eat quinoa for Ekadashi, which is a full moon fasting day, uh, the the Hare Krishnas will go straight to Prabhupada and follow only what Prabhupada says. They don't take the words of the other living orders seriously compared to um, this would be more like initiated devotees. They would follow strictly what Prabhupada taught because he laid out a very systematic way of practicing the religion with the four regulative principles of vegetarianism, no onion, no garlic, no mushroom, no fish, uh, with no intoxication, including no caffeine, no coffee, no uh, tea or chocolate, uh, and no gambling and no illicit sex and chanting 16 rounds. So he actually lowered the 16, 64 to 16 because his devotees couldn't, his disciples couldn't do it. So he had to adjust. And even when his uh, adjustments are criticised as heretical or going against what was originally taught by the previous gurus and the previous senior 
representatives of the Gaudiya Vaishnava religion, or even the original founder Chaitanya, people will still adhere to what Prabhupada said because they they see the results of what he did as a reason to follow him. So because um, so much positive, what they believe is that there's so much positive change that he created. I think 108 temples were built, maybe more, um, during the time he was alive and a lot of money was raised. And I think he sold the most Bhagavad Gita's in the world, millions of copies. I can't remember the exact number, but because so many lives were changed um, through his teachings, not through someone else's teachings on the same religion, people uh, venerate what he did as the, stand, the golden standard of religion. So it's like if in Christianity there are different popes or there's different orders like Catholicism, Orthodox, the Hare Krishna version of the uh, Christianity debate would be where the true Vaishnavas are. Um, maybe that's not how they would frame it, but this is the high. They do say that they believe that this is the highest path, and that Prabhupada taught the best path. So every other path is has its advantages. They accept Christianity, for example. They believe that Jesus was a um, an avatar or a son of God. They believe that Muhammad was also like a representative of Krishna, but they believe um, they don't really closely follow the Quran or the Bible. They reinterpret it to fit their um, Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. So you'll have Christians who join Hare Krishna and they still believe in Jesus and uh, they still believe in Christ and Krishna because for them, there's no contradiction. Krishna religion accepts um, Jesus and Muhammad. They only don't accept when Shiva, you know, within Hinduism, they're very strict. They, in the GBC, for example, they banned um, the Durga festivals, the goddess of war. They've banned her the worship of her as the supreme for Navaratri festival and they've banned um, like a text by Tulsidas called the Ram Charit Manas which is about Ram but because it has uh, an Advaita Vedanta undertone they consider it tinged with impersonalism which goes against their philosophy that Krishna is a person a spiritual person in the spiritual realm and he's not a He's not a, just an energy. They believe that there's a direct relationship with Krishna and the, the devotee, which is what they call themselves. So um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I'm not sure if I went yeah. off topic. No, no, no. It's all of the information, especially the explanation of the, the phrases that are used within the movement and the translation into English is really helpful for people who may not be aware of the terminology, because then a listener might come across some of the terminology in the future and be able to understand exactly what those things okay. mean, when a lot of the time, some of that may be uh, alien to, to primarily uh, English speakers. Yeah. So you, you said the name Chaitanya a little while back, and I yeah. just wanted... Uh, wondered if you could explain the significance of that person within the Krishna movement to somebody who may not have heard of ISKCON before. So in India, they have what is called Varna system, but I guess over time it transformed into the caste system. So Chaitanya was in the middle of this um, situation where the Brahmins at the time, what he... Here, the, his, uh, na the narrative of the Gaudiya Vaishnavas is, is that the Brahmins at the time were corrupted or they were discriminatory and practicing discrimination against other parts of society, other um, people who weren't Brahmins. I'm not sure exactly if 
they were using the Vina system or the caste system at the time because this would have been before the British. Um, but it was during the Islamic, the Mughal rule. So Chaitanya rose out of this environment of discrimination against non-Brahmins, let's say. And he, he came in to reform the religion. He, rather than people focusing on textual knowledge and reading books, which he is also acclaimed for, but rather than focusing knowledge on Vedanta, for example, and studiousness in Sanskrit learning, he brought in the practice of chanting the Maha Mantra. And he took this out of the Upanishads. I'm not sure which one, maybe the Kata, I'm not, or the Kenna Upanishad. And in this Upanishad, it said, you know, the only way for salvation in the Kali Yuga is to chant the Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So he popularized this. Before him, there was another person who I won't mention now, but um, in case it kind of confuses the audience, but he brought the Maha Mantra into popular popular memory, I would say. So he disregarded the more, I guess, discriminatory practices. And he would go chanting from street to street, city to city, chanting the love of Krishna. And he was a mystic, so he would cry. And in his hagiographies, uh, in the hagiography, which is the devotional biography that contains uh, the miracles of someone. So it's not really considered exactly historical due to the, the miracles listed in their, in the text. In these uh, hagiographies, he went into various forests and the animals were also chanting and singing with him. So he would cry, he would faint. His disciples would also cry in ecstasy chanting the name of Krishna, they would play the drums and chant Krishna's name. So uh, in Judaism, they have a similar figure called the Baal Shem Tov, who was a Jewish mystic who would also have uh, divine mystical experiences. So that uh, Chaitanya was this reform move, uh, reformist who brought in devotion to Krishna. Um, those the practices from the Brahmins at the time, I think there were smarter Brahmins who believe in Advaita Vedanta philosophy. He wanted to bring a personal relationship with God. So he has a, there's a text, I haven't read it. Um, it's called the Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is kind of the, um, the disciples that I was with, they called this the graduate text or the postgraduate, where you start off with the Bhagavad Gita, which is the story between Krishna and Arjuna on the battle of Kurukshetra. Um, uh, Arjuna is fighting against his um, uncles and cousins, the, the Kauravas, and he's the Pandava. So that's the Bhagavad Gita. And then the um, Srimad Bhagavatam, which is a, uh, a series of various stories based on Krishna, and it's narrated to or by Shukadeva Goswami, who's a a, um, a Swami kind of a figure. Uh, and then there is the Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is read after the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th canto, is the most famous. And it contains stories of Krishna, Radha, the plate, um, the pastimes between Krishna and his consort Radha, the romantic and amorous dancing and singing and ecstatic experiences between him and the cowherd girls and the cowherd boys uh, in Goloka Vrindavan. So they believe that this is kind of the, their, they believe this is their version of heaven. So that's the place where they want to serve Krishna um, when they reach the highest stage of devotion, uh, which at the end they believe is decided by Krishna anyway. So you could be born as a hair on Krishna's chest. You could be born as a grass. You could be born in another life. You could come back to earth 
like similar like to a bodhisattva you could come back to earth to help humanity or you could be reborn into the heavenly realm of um, Galak Vrindavan and serve Krishna for eternity as his eternal devotee. Oh my goodness. Considering yeah. the amount of time that you're involved with the movement, you certainly are well educated and versed in the history and practices of ISKCON. The, the overview that you've just given us is, is it, 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 it may not seem in depth to you, but to us, that was a wealth of information that you've just given us. Yeah, I spent a lot of time understanding the philosophy, researching it, um, going into the, even the organisational structure of the religion, the history, things that were peripheral to the actual beliefs itself, the actual theology of it. I was very interested in the theology and I it appealed to me because I was I found that Buddhism didn't offer me that theistic devotional element with music and chanting and uh, these more um sensory kind of visual practices for visual sensory emotional forms of meditation spirituality it was uh, with Buddhism it was more austere and um, there was like chanting Namo Amitabha, but because uh, the, the practice of Buddhism that my parents, well, not really that they got involved in, but the, the type of Buddhism, uh, Vietnamese Buddhism that they engaged in at the temple in my parents' house was Pure Land Buddhism, which was a mixture of like Vietnamese culture and Taoism, ancestor worship. Um, pure land, Mahayana, Pure Land Buddhism beliefs about Bodhisattva and being reborn in the heavenly realms. But even then, I didn't feel deeply connected to it. So I guess when I get involved in any kind of spiritual practice or religion, I do a lot of research. But I did especially, I would say the, re the religion that I've probably researched the most would be the Hare Krishna religion because I was actively practicing it with other disciples. So my learning curve was really quick really fast and I took notes as well like I have notes in my books um even though I've left the Hare Krishna religion I'm still interested in Hinduism as a whole in yoga and the philosophy of yoga and the various schools of Vedanta that came before the Gaudiya Vaishnava movement so I can contextualize it as well like I can see how um, ISKCON is different from the other sects of Hinduism and how the newer, the neo version, like the new, new versions of Hinduism, which I'll just call neo Hinduism, compared to the classical versions of the Ramanujas, Vishishta, Advaita, Sri Vaishnava version of Hinduism and the, the Shakta versions of Hinduism where they have... Um, specific sects like the Kamakya tradition or the Shaivism traditions. So I um, I also did like some courses as well, like after I left the Krishna religion slash cult. It's kind of confusing what to call it because there are people in there who sincerely believe what they are doing, but at the same time there are very cult-like practices and some groups are more culty than other groups so because it's there is like a central hub of Krishna teachings the GBC in India for example um, and specific gurus but because they've got a hundred and you know a hundred plus gurus um, various you know small differences can be found um, and then you have riff, like you have movements in the Krishna, within the Krishna religion called the IRM. I think it's called. They are against what GBC does, but they still believe in Prabhupada, uh, and they believe they can their gurus can initiate on behalf of Prabhupada and thus make disciples of Prabhupada rather than make their own disciples, which the, um, the current uh, ISKCON is extremely against that. 
so there are various different, oh, and then there's also Gaudiya Mutt, which is, um, they still believe in Krishna consciousness, but they practice it slightly differently. Um, so I've also met people from Gaudiya Mutt, and I've met someone who got initiated into the Sri Vaishnava religion, by, which was created by Ramanuja or it was popularized by Ramanuja. And I've uh, watched some content from uh, people who are from the Advaita school. And also with my courses, um, the course that I did with the yogic studies group um, directed by Seth Powell, he, um, he provided a lot of courses that talked about various practices in Shaivism, Shaktism, uh, he didn't, there was nothing on Vaishnavism. There's a Bhagavad Gita course, um, Samkhya, the Samkhya Karika course, which is a, a text based on this, uh, on a book called the Samkhya Karika, which talks about the specific philosophy. It's like an elemental philosophy of um, like 25 elements, but I won't get too much into that because it might, it might be information overload. So yeah, I kind of learnt as much as I could about everything in Hinduism because it's mm -hmm. so vast and broad. I think we not just yeah, the Krishna context. Yeah, your depth of knowledge is is so impressive, and I wonder, I wonder how much. I hope we get as much information from our interview as possible, but I don't know if that's going to be something that, that we're able to do because it sounds like you just have so much to offer. Uh, but, 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 but we'll try our best. We'll try our best. So let's, yeah. let's start at the beginning of your, of your journey. You come across ISKCON at the age of 27, 28? 28, was, yeah, 28. So you're 28 years old. You've always had an interest in Eastern philosophies and mysticism, maybe some like hereditary connection with your grandfather who you'd never met but had also had similar interest in a vast amount of different spiritual movements so how yeah. did you actually come across ISKCON and how did you become involved so I was on a new age server on discord which is a like it's kind of like a gaming it started off as a gaming app but now it's kind of a social media app where people can chat and live stream and have conversations with people. So I joined a server on there and I listened to some people talk about, um, well, mainly two people. One person talked about the Bhagavad Gita. He actually played it in the voice chat on the New Age server. And people weren't that interested. They were talking over it. So I decided I would listen to this on my own. Um, and then I also spoke to another, I made a friend on a Myers-Briggs server who talked about the Bhagavad Gita and I, he, he talked about comparative religion as well. So I decided, you know, I want to get into this. I've always wanted to read Bhagavad Gita. It was quoted by Oppenheimer, the person who created the atomic bomb. It was mentioned by various other authors, um, Ameri like, uh, transcendentalist authors in the United States. So it was always a text that I wanted to get into. Um, and I was always interested in Hinduism more than Buddhism because of their idea that there is an Atman, a consciousness or a soul in the Gaudiya version uh, compared to the, the non-self of Buddhism. So when I listened to the audiobook for the first time all the way through, and as I was taking notes, I fell in love with the message. And this was the as it is version. So I fell in love with this message. Um, and I wanted to practice whatever it was teaching. And I knew it was based off the Hare Krishna. I, I knew it was the Hare Krishna um, book, but I didn't know so much about uh, what they did other than basic knowledge about it being a cult so I watched some documentaries on their religion 
um, and I decided, you know, this is kind of related to my interest in wanting to learn Sanskrit, wanting to practice, um, wanting to be a monk, which I had wanted to do since I was in the 11th grade. It kind of connected with everything that I was already interested in, vegetarianism, in morality, in chanting mantras, using the Sanskrit language as a spiritual practice. So um, I kind of had an idealised vision going into it, um, despite having the knowledge about it being a cult, which is kind of funny. I was also interested in cults as well, so I decided to call up the temple and then a girl said to me, um, oh, I'll contact you with a local monk um, and his name's Davija, so I got into contact with him um, and I told uh, the girl over the phone and I told him that I wanted to be a monk and I was interested in initiation and all of this stuff and I downloaded a PDF to their initiation <laughs> their initiation manual and all the books that you needed to read. And I had read the books, except for the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, and then I got, uh, like, deeper into that religion. But that's how I started. Um, since my childhood interest and then since last year with the, uh, my childhood interest with monasticism and last year my my encounter with the Bhagavad Gita and uh, the Western kind of experience of Hinduism and New Age philosophy, and then actual direct contact in around November with Hare Krishna devotees. So it kind of was, I would say it was gradual for me, but um, within that time frame of one to two, yeah, one year, or like maybe six, seven months, a lot happened. Uh, in such a short period and um, it's kind of shocking to even think how how I even um, how my energy was so purely directed into that one thing because it's very hard for me to focus on things as well um, with like mental health and getting distracted and anxiety but when it came to the Hare Krishna religion I put it, I just jumped straight into it. It was pretty, pretty um, intense. It, I think you may be one of the. I think you may be one of the very first people that we've had on the show who purposefully sought out a group that they knew had actually been labelled as a cult. Yeah, I. It was. It, I kind of wanted to do a psychological experiment I know this sounds terrible um, in retrospect but um, I had experienced sexual abuse as a child and I wanted to understand like what is the mindset of sexual abuse and this is was a very um, date like I guess this is a very unsafe but like psychologically dangerous way to explore this curiosity because I have a, a very curious person so I wanted to understand like the dynamics of a cult and also the experience of um, like a very uh, presenting way of uh, a very strong image of what authenticity and traditional tradition is. So I wanted to explore that, even though I didn't really think it was authentic in my personal opinion. I felt like the whole idea of them being, you know, the, the, the most authentic representation of devotional, monotheistic uh, Krishna uh, devotion in the most, mono, the most pure form of monotheistic devotion to Krishna in, uh, in the world. So I wanted to break it down and explore what it meant and then I also wanted to pursue my personal interest of becoming a monk and learning Sanskrit obviously it didn't turn out this way like I realized uh I was also being manipulated into um attending more events and uh what how I had originally wanted the 
I guess like psychological um, curiosity satis to satisfy the, the, my psychological curiosity about the human mind and about religion and about the nature of existence that was kind of pushed aside and I was kind of pressured to attend more events and uh, to do more volunteering, which they call service, devotional service. It's one of the ways that people express their love for Krishna by doing practical acts of devotion, cooking for Krishna and then serving that to other people, uh, offering food to Krishna, uh, which becomes mercy or it's translated, uh, it's called prasad in Sanskrit. So all of these ritualistic practices um, get involved and implemented and I was also, I'm also very attracted to rituals. So I found a lot of their practices very enjoyable. Um, I started chanting and then like within like, you know, two months or something, I did 16 rounds and then I started doing that every day. So it kind of gave me like a leveling system. I know this sounds, it's not really a game, but I kind of, felt like I could achieve little things and those little things would be rewarding. But then it got to a point where there was a lot of manipulation and lying going on, lying, especially lying by omission. So people would have a lot of hidden intentions and I would only find out by doing research or by asking other people who knew about the religion and then I wouldn't tell them. And then when I did tell them, that I was going to this place or this person, they would have a massive freak out. So, um, and they would only show me through their facial reactions. They would never, um, you know, one of the senior members who was running the Bhakti Lounge, which is a side project of the ISKCON religion. It's not directly part of the temple. It's a separate thing under their guru, which who, who is also not directly controlling the temple, which is in control by the temple manager. So he, uh, the Devam Rita Swami, who's the guru of the, the Bhakti Lounge, the Mantra Lounge people, um, they wanted to um, accumulate more disciples for their group. And I never knew this until I started listening to his lectures and I kind of started to analyse it. And then I started asking other people and then all of the things, the puzzle fit together. And then when I brought this up that they were being dishonest, um, I would get accused of being ungrateful when I brought up that I was no longer interested in the Bhagavad Gita classes. I would get called fickle. So little kind of, my, I don't know if I'll call them microaggressions or abuses, but I would just, I can't really think of the most accurate entries, but like these little kind of, microaggressions that they did I started to question uh, and I there was a point where I realized I can't have um, a negotiation or conversation even though that's what they advocate in their religion which is to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship where you open up to someone who's a devotee and you have a, a deep connection with them about your inner world and they they kind of play like a therapist role um, on top of the guru that you have or on top of a guru that you are aspiring to take shelter of. So in their system, they have all of these um, interesting idealistic uh, forms of dealing with emotional, psychological, um, spiritual life problems, marriage. They have a whole system for everything but it only sounds perfect uh, in theory. Uh, so in practice, um, they, they didn't have this pure love and pure happiness. They were just like normal people, but hiding it. They were hiding the fact that they had very human problems like jealousy and sexuality and um, even though they had secrets, they were secret about their secrets. You know, sometimes people will say things like, oh, that's a personal, 
but they wouldn't even um, acknowledge that they were hiding anything. Uh, and Sorry, Michael, kind of... just one second. Your your internet connection is dipping in and out again. I think we you might have to turn your camera off as well for a little while just to see if that. Oh, sorry about oh, that. No, it's uh, okay. Let me... <laughs> uh, let me stop the video. Okay, is that better now? Give it, give it just a few okay. seconds to see if it works itself out. Uh, you're giving us so much great information that I don't want any of it to be lost because of the. Uh, ah, okay. The I'm glad that you told me that because I would have kept going with. Um, um, yeah, there, 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 there were so many things in what you've just said that uh, that I wanted to kind of pick apart oh, and, okay. and go back over. So, sure. first of all, just to comment on what on what you were just saying before about not being completely transparent about things as you became more involved with the movement, that there was a testimony that I read online of somebody who spoke about being approached by somebody who was recruiting for RISCON. Um, and, and when this person told them, oh, you know, well, I'm a Christian, it was worded to them that it, it didn't matter if you had a religious affiliation elsewhere because you could practice being close to Krishna simultaneously to your religion. But then over time, it was actually kind of systematically expected that you would spend less time going to church on Sunday and less time involved in religious commitments because you had too many commitments to Krishna to be able to fulfill those religious commitments that you had elsewhere so I thought that that was an interesting thing yes. to add to what you were already saying there and what you said about being interested in knowing that that this movement had the cult label attached to it, but but almost giving yourself a social experiment by going into the movement to kind of see what it was really like. And you said it was, was strange and it might sound strange to some of the listeners, but actually on the subreddit, r slash cults, there are weekly posts, sometimes daily posts of people who will access the subreddit and say things like, is this a cult or I think I've just been approached by a cult member or I think somebody's trying to bring me into their cult. And a lot of the people will say like, this is what happened. This was the interaction. They told me to meet them here or this is what I do next if I want to join. Okay. And a lot of these people will then say, I'm thinking about joining just to see if I can find out anything else. And so many of the people in the comments will then say, if that's what you decide to do, just be extremely careful because there will be very, very clever ways of of bringing you further and further into the group that that you might not realize what is happening to your freedom of mind until it's too late which is kind of almost what you mentioned there about the small manipulations and the um lying through omission that happens like kind of slowly and slowly over time as you became more involved with the movement itself yeah so that's an interesting point that you mentioned that it's not only me who has curiosity about new religious movements. It's, it, there's a subreddit on it. I also saw a YouTube channel about a girl who recorded videos with the Westboro Baptist Church mm, out of wow. curiosity. And she also recorded with Scientology and talked about her experiences and made a vlog. And she talked about how she was getting pressured to attend more courses and pay for more courses. So there are people like that out there who are similar to me, but just curiosity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And yeah. the human I think it's interest as well. Yeah. Yeah. Just to, just to want to learn more, like, Oh, is it, yeah. is it really as bad as people say it is, or is it really as culty as people say it is? I want to find out for myself. Uh, but, but yeah. you also mentioned a bit further back that when you originally reached out and you were partnered with the, a monk a monk in the area that that you lived in that there would be an initiation into the movement so how did that how did that happen how did you officially become involved I wasn't in ISCON? Initiated. okay um, but I was a affiliated and volunteering regularly for the Marshall Lounge which is a movement started by 
um, Devamrita Swami, who's a guru in ISKCON, and he kind of grew into the role in the 80s and became more well-known, you know, after the 90s into the right. 2000s. So his... Um, I didn't really pay much attention to him at the beginning. I just thought, oh, I don't really like his talks. I find him kind of annoying. Um, but And this is the talks given in the Mantra Lounge? Um, he had online talks and he also had Zoom calls. So I had listened to some of them, but I thought a lot of it was kind of nonsense because uh, it wasn't really, he wasn't really directly addressing the issues that I thought were really important, the philosophical life issues. He was actually addressing very simple, um, what is happiness? You know, he would just kind of water things down. And then uh, in his later lectures uh, that he would uh, give to his more senior disciples, he directly told them things like, um, don't tell them that you're there to preach to them. Just serve them nice food and act like it's completely natural. So he would actually encourage people to uh, lie. I consider that a form of lying. So he would in encourage people to conceal their true intentions. And um, I kind of listened to these as I was getting out of the movement, but it was actually very difficult to leave because I think they wanted me to stay. Now that I think about it, they it, it did seem like they actually wanted me to stay more. So maybe the monk was kind of putting more pressure and effort and negativity and microaggressions into his interactions with me. Um, but I had to uh, stop contacting them and tell them, you know, I had to say to Devija and Nikeshri, who were the monks there, that I... No, I'm going to focus on studying Sanskrit. I know that sounds similar to the Hare Krishna religion, but it's it's not what you guys are offering, to be honest. Uh, and I, I'm not going to be attending the Mantra Land events regularly. If I go, I go. If I want to go to the temple, I'll go to the temple, not their Mantra Lounge, because they were um, under the instructions of Devarita Swami, which they didn't tell me. Um, he did not want... Western devotees mixing with uh, the Indian devotees because he didn't want the um, the strictness of whole uh, Hare Krishna religion to be kind of watered watered down and made into like a fun kind of um, not fun but like a watered down temple based experience. He wanted people to become very disciplined, chanting regularly not being disillusioned with the movement, which, some people, which he in his lectures said that people were disillusioned, they're more senior members. So he wanted kind of to preserve a state of innocence and naivety, but also strict discipline about the Hare Krishna religion. And he wanted to create his own kind of subgroup where he could control, tightly control the environment and have his the senior disciples manage it without the control of the temple manager, um, Annie Ruda, which is Melbourne manager. He, he had his side thing, and then he would kind of introduce his disciples slowly to the temple once they were ready to get initiated. So that was his kind of strategy. And I, I didn't really figure this out until I started reading materials, analysing the how Hare Krishna is, um, where, how Hare Krishna religion works in, you know, in the modern age. I kind of knew how, about the, the child abuses, but I didn't really know much about the inner, the inner workings of, you know, what people with different gurus think of each other or how gurus would control certain parts of the local country that I'm in, the local part of the town that I live in, um, what the Hare Krishna religion was like specifically in Melbourne, in Australia, in New Zealand. I didn't really know that aspect of the religion. I kind of just knew the history and the most um, sensationalist parts of the religion. But I would say that it's equally as, even though 
I have not heard of any um, instances. I have read that there were like abuses even in the Melbourne temple, but they have been covered up. Mm. Uh, and there were like uh, sexual um, illicit, illicit, elicitation, elicitings, so of uh, women. But um, if Devon Rita Swami again, he in a recording on SoundCloud and on the one of the Hare Krishna news websites, who's like an independent from ISKCON, they revealed his an audio recording that he, for some reason, was made of him saying that a girl who was sexually assaulted or who was sexually elicited should, should just accuse herself of making a mistake. Oh, rather my goodness. Than, yeah, rather than holding the person accountable for a sexual assault incident or a sexual harassment incident, he directly encouraged people, he directly encouraged his um, his disciples to tell the victim to blame herself. Oh, my uh, Which I think was, yeah, I think it's very strange because, um, you know, there are probably people who know this and they, ex- they accept it. So they accept what's happened and what he says and they think that he's done a really good job in... No, what he said yeah, that, is so irresponsible. G- given the position that he is in, so irresponsible and yeah. immoral and unethical and and just just wrong. Um, and it's difficult. It's it, it it it's hard when because you have said that. Well, he's called he in one of his uh, talks. He called women. Toilets, no. unmarried women, public toilets. So he said some pretty outrageous things and offensive things about women. Do you think that his word, like propupards, might be taken as gospel by some people? Yeah, so they take it very seriously, but they don't tell you that this is what Devamrita Swami says. They tell you that this is what Prabhupada wanted. Oh, this, is the right. Har- this is the Hare Krishna way. This is about chanting 16 rounds and doing pure devotional service. So they, they reframe everything to make it fit and suit the, right. ideo- the dominant ideology. But they have their own agenda going on, which is they want to accumulate disciples in their set and they don't want other people to know what they're doing. Yes, Yes, and, and the behaviour and information control that you so withhold, just... Deliberately withholding information and controlling the flow of information to who gets it. And they would also scheme about, um, like, me, about my friend Jen who was attending, so they would kind of have conversations about other people and how to get them more involved and how to... They would frame it in a way that they sounded like they cared about the person, but, in fact, they would really in what they were really interested in is just was just getting them to go more to their events and commit to their group and religion and when I told one person something uh, I realized that other people knew so when I told Bhakti for example that I was no longer attending their classes in the Nectar of Devotion which is uh, one of the texts that you read before you get initiated I found out that one of the other devotees, Jade, had just casually mentioned to me, oh, so how do you, what do you think about um, this other class that you're attending with the Nandas group? And that was really weird because I never intended for him to know that I was attending other um, So your classes. information is being, is being publicised or, or shared between yeah. other people. Okay. And my information, but also my friend's information, and they would justify it uh, in the way that it's all done for Krishna's service. So everything was framed in a devotional, spiritual Explained away, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they would rationalise a lot of their negative behaviours. So what I would consider negative, what you would consider negative, they would just say, you know, that's Kami's, they're, um, they're non-devotees, they're just in the material world, we're pure devotees or we're following the instructions of Prabhupada and this is what he wanted to chant regularly and to eat vegetarian and to love Krishna and to do, to, uh, you know, to make more, to spread Krishna consciousness. So they would, strong, like, 
you have to kind of really truly believe this in order to um you know i, I don't know if like commit these atrocities is the right term but like you'd have to really believe in your own lies or delusion to deliberately harm other people or deliberately um, mislead other people so they truly kind of even even um even though they were doing a lot of messing around with the original teachings when i spoke to davija the monk who was kind of mentoring me and i said oh why don't you guys wear tilak the sacred uh, clay markings on your forehead every day why don't you do what Prabhupada said, which was to wear certain types of clothing regularly, the traditional monk clothing. And he said, oh, we're just being practical. So he would explain away how certain things were practical, so he, therefore he didn't have to do it. But I started to realise that they would do a lot of weird things, like you know, use expensive phones, and um, apparently that's for Krishna's service, and they would accept um, wealth because it's um, Krishna's feminine energy. It's Lakshmi, which is the goddess of wealth. So they would have explanations for everything. Um, if they would wear expensive, you know, three hundred dollar jackets from Kathmandu, uh, and they would present themselves in more um, fashionable ways. If they were going to more expensive suburbs in Melbourne, so people would be more convinced by their appearance and buy more books, which they called book distribution. They didn't call it, they would say it's, you know, um, spreading the knowledge of Krishna, but really they were funding the temple and they would have to do this every day. They would need to sell a certain amount of books, make a certain amount of money, at least $8 per book, or um, they would have to break even if they sold, um, you know, a certain number of books each day. So there was a very, there's a very pragmatic and practical reasoning behind everything, but it's never really explained to you unless you really analyze it or look deeply into it. It's all you really see is the positive spiritual thing. You'll okay. never hear about the critical aspects of the religion. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess that must be difficult. Disciples. It must be difficult in that sense to navigate the movement itself, then, especially if you're there to perhaps become involved in, in some of the services that focus on the teachings of the movement and the heritage of the movement and the ideals around the movement, but then also to kind of see what a high demand control group is like from the inside. I suppose then it must be very precarious to and navigate your way through especially with the thought behavior and information control that you've just explained there and you mentioned at the very start of the episode that you believe that some temples and some gatherings and groups within the ISKCON movement may be more cult-like than others and from what you're saying here the, the mantra lounge itself has lots of manipulation and coercive tactics involved yeah. And, and so they were definitely more culty than the actual temple, which is very strange. Uh, it is strange I, when you think that ISKCON itself yeah. has been labeled a cult. So then you've got like cults within cults, then almost, if, if, if it stands to reason that, that the Hare Krishna movement it, it does have cult like methods actual, of control. There's, a, there's an actual special reason for this, which I've done the research into. And it's called the Hinduization. This is what sociologists call it. They call it the Hinduization of ISKCON. So uh, families from India who are living kind of normal lives, they join the temple as a temple congregation, like something that you would go to church on Sundays. So for them, they would no longer, there was you know, a shortage of people becoming serious devotees and chanting 16 rounds a day and becoming monks. Families would go in, children would go in, and people would have day jobs rather than give up everything. ISKCON has kind of been domesticated uh, in more in the Indian community, not in the Western community, where you have Indian families from Hindu backgrounds who don't necessarily have 100% dedication to the religion. And the people who do have dedication are funding the religion using 
money sourced from their own day jobs rather than uh, necessarily being full-time devotees or disciples. So it's transformed into a family kind of based movement with kids, children, young uh, adults, parents attending regular meetings. So it's kind of um, become less culty in in a micro way, and then it's become more culty in other ways with with these movements like Radhanath Swami's. Um, I don't know what his lounges are called, but Radhanath Swami's disciples with uh, Devamrita Swami's mantra lounge. So the cult element is still there, but it's uh, it's kind of hidden away and they kind of market Krishna consciousness as a mindfulness practice. So they, you know, it's similar to the Gadampa Buddhist religion. They kind of present you as... Uh, present to you images of people meditating on mountains and having delicious vegetarian food and comments of people uh, with, you know, kind of titles of how to de-stress and how to live a life of peace and how to overcome anxiety. So they kind of use mental health as a platform to lure people in. So they try to take people with mental health problems um, and... Uh, indoctrinate them into the Krishna religion. Uh, whereas with like the Hindu way that they, the way that the Indian community markets Hare Krishna religion, you straight up get pictures of Krishna, you straight up get pictures of Prabhupada, you straight up get pictures of, you know, people talking about love and devotion. So it's very straightforward because, you know, Indians are used to the imagery and the language and the um, culture because it's, it's, they were born with them. Anything to do with Iskon or Krishna, it's not foreign to them. Whereas with Westerners, they have done this very kind of deliberate um, whitewashing of the Indian culture to make it look like it's kind of some urban meditation group, which it isn't. It's not urban meditation. It's still the Krishna religion. You yeah. used words, as you've spoken, like affiliate, initiate, devotee. So... Is there a hierarchy or pyramid system in place within ISKCON in terms of your level of commitment? Uh, is it sort of like a, a a phase progression? You you kind of have to go step by step by step. How does how does it work in terms of recruitment? So I noticed this structure. This um, I haven't really analyzed it in a business or economic sense. It has been called a pyramid scheme by other um, people who've reviewed or uh, analysed the religion. And I do consider it a pyramid scheme, actually, because, for example, it's run by uh, the Mantra Lounge and the Mantra, uh, the disciples of Devanri Daswami. He runs, he has many um, groups. He has a group in New Zealand, in Philadelphia. He has two at least two groups in Melbourne and they don't always communicate with each other. They have like the urban urban yoga, which is also an ISKCON movement, but um, it's done with different disciples with the same guru. And then there's a mantra lounge, which is the same guru, but different disciples. So he has two groups in Melbourne, but they don't, um, they don't mix. And they also don't mix with the temple, but they're kind of like competing against each other. And then they groups. I actually researched about what this this method of recruitment and I guess proselytization is called, and it's called um, bhakti vriksha. I think that means root. And they they kind of plant a tree, you know, and then they plant another one, and then they plant another one. That's kind of how they um, they view it. Uh, at least in that article that I read, who devotee that this is how they want to kind of create uh, they want to spread the religion which small groups spreading across they kind of want to it's it, in a way they want to repeat what is which I don't think is ever going to happen again uh because the movement's changed so much people have access to anything up
rather than seeing it as a pyramid scheme, they see it as more like an organic tree, trees and roots and creating a grassroots movement of spreading Krishna consciousness. So again, they rather than seeing it in um, in the perspective of how it's potentially manipulative with the pyramid structure of the of the people, like the kind of the free labor that people are doing um, who are at the bottom, and then the uh, the you know it starts off with participants, and then participants who leave um, don't they lose relevance, and then the participants who start volunteering they take instruction from the senior devotees. So I was like a volunteer taking instruction from the monk, the vija, the brahmachari, which they call the monks. And then the monk takes instruction, various different instructions, because he's living at the temple. He needs to make sure the temple operations are running smoothly, especially in the ashram, because he is a senior monk in the ashram under the instruction of a ashram manager, ashram manager and also the temple manager who work together. And so there's the ashram manager, there's the senior monks, there's the junior monks who just join into the temple. Uh, there are non-devotees who are interested in the religion volunteering. And then there are there are like there are high more committed people who get access to secret classes who which I find really strange. I I thought like it would to me, I think people should just straight up tell you what classes they have. But I, I got access to secret classes because I started um, chanting regularly. I got access to the okay. house, to, to chanting in the house in the morning because I started okay. doing 16 rounds. They wouldn't advertise this to anyone unless you they thought you were ready for it. Yeah. And that was going to be kind of my next question was what was your average day or week in when you first became involved with ISKCON? How did it look in terms of your commitments to the movement and you've then mentioned there that you went on to actually start chanting 16 rounds so you you've yeah. told us what the the chant is previously and you're just you're just expected to say that 16 times with your beads is that right yeah so there are 16 beads that you have uh the the, the beads name, the name of the beads in uh, Sanskrit is Japa Mala. So you have these mala beads and you chant Hare Krishna um, 108 times. Actually, it's 108 beads. So, no, 16 beads and you chant them 108 times. And then you also have counting beads. So you can, so uh, there's the 108 counting beads. No, there's a 108 beads that you move through when you chant Hare Krishna and then there's like 16 counting beads like kind of like an abacus and then as you do 108 you move the abacus to the um to the right and then you just continue until you get 16 and that will last one hour and one and a half hours um there's also like phone apps that you can use if you don't have um physical beads with you so they was your question about um, the beads or was it how yeah, I... Yeah, it was, it was kind yeah. of, the question was, what did your average day and week look like in terms oh, of commi commitment to the movement overall? I know that the chanting oh, okay. becomes a, a big part of the the time given yes. to to Krishna and and devotion to to Krishna through activities like chanting. So I, I that was kind of going to be my inroad to that subject around... Oh, okay high high demand uh, for closeness to Krishna? So this was something that I kind of, they never really um, forced anyone to chant, which is interesting, but they would always kind of, this was their whole strategy as well, which I found out from listening to Devon Rita Swami, was to make it look like chanting 16 rounds was normal. And so I have always, because of my, inclination to monasticism and mystical experiences and ascetic practices of you know meditation and all that 
and vegetarianism. So I, I did think it was normal um, due to my own inclinations. So I would attend their meetings. There, usually I would just go to their kirtan, which is their devotional singing. Um, I was offered uh, a volunteer position to lead the kirtan because so, I come from a music background. I studied music in high school and did it in university and played in various bands and took lessons. So I was competent to perform devotional music. And I, I really felt it too because I was a very spiritual person. So I was singing these mantras, um, devotional mantras, with a lot of feeling and emotion and sincerity. So they could, they could see that and they could see I was sincere um, and they and I brought in um, various melodies that I was learning. So it was very interactive. Uh, it felt kind of fun and natural, um, but I knew that I was just a very enthusiastic person. I kind of was still guarded to some degree that um, this can end. Like I thought to myself, my spontaneity could end and these kind of people wouldn't like it right. uh, I, I kind of had I kind of had that feeling at the back of my mind so you're um, the because I was very positive at the beginning and the acceptance that you had from these people felt very conditional upon you continuing to be as open-minded and as motivated as you seemed to be at the at the time you first joined yeah, so they did expect things from me and they kind of thought it would be natural. And then it kind of came as a, I don't know, they didn't really say we're shocked, but they would start behaving very microaggressively towards me with their facial expressions and with their, with Bhakti, I told her I would meet, you know, I was meeting some devotees who were Hare Krishna devotees, but just not, Mantra Lounge, Devon Rita, um, you know, as, uh, affiliated or under the control of his, or, um, under his specific Right, control. so now you've got the us and then she, versus them. And she it, would, yeah, she would react really strongly and she would say to me, oh, you're seeing this person, you're seeing that person. And it was very hysterical and I was actually, I was kind of concerned that she was kind of not addressing how she really felt, and instead she was criticising me uh, in a very passive-aggressive kind of way. Like, it wasn't very direct. She was just kind of giving me some kind of backhanded comment. Mm. And I it, and people would do this a lot. They would not directly address things and they would just shove it under the rug and I was really um, frustrated. Yes, it. I can imagine, especially because you mentioned before, about the anxiety that that you'd struggled with yes yes through, throughout your life to have people that you, you are that maybe you know to have people in certain positions or people that you maybe look up to or people that you respect or, or people that are in positions that you perhaps are striving for or even just the opinion of anybody else for for people to come across as passive aggressive, it, it's very unhelpful when you are somebody that is very anxious, that does struggle with ill mental health, to have those signals come across and and people not be transparent with you and tell you what why they're upset or why they're unhappy with you and to kind of, um, you know, dance around the issue in the centre. That's very, very unhelpful for people that feel that way. So I imagine you perhaps you went home at times and felt very unsettled or couldn't switch off or felt like maybe you were not devoted enough in in your journey to to you know being closer to Krishna or in your devotion to the mantra lounge in particular I don't know if that's the the reaction that you had to to these particular types of behaviors from from those in positions of power for me, it was almost like a test because I had the spontaneous 
affection and kindness and voluntary submissive attitude, which they actually, you know, it's in the scriptures that being a submissive devotee under the instruction of a guru and serving other devotees is the prime example of how a Krishna conscious person should be. So they always kind of, I don't know if they necessarily strive for this ideal, but they promote it uh, verbally and they constantly pay lip service to this idea. And sometimes they try it to the, to the best that they can, but a lot of the time they can't really live up to these standards of pure submission, pure devotion. So I also took on this attitude very naturally of, yeah, let's let's be very submissive. Let's be very pure and devotional to this spiritual teaching. Even though Prabhupada, I don't agree with his comments on gays and women, he had a you know a deeper message of love for Krishna, and that's what's going to bring everyone together. And I, I'm just a humble servant. Like I started taking on these kind of um, traits of explaining nice, away certain things. Yeah, and... I would rationalize things as well. Exactly, I would rationalize things as pure devotion and submission. Right, and they would do it. They would do it too. To themselves so we would do it to each other and it's it almost becomes like so unconscious that you just it's, it's like you just breathe this very deceptive kind of attitude to life that mm-hmm. everything that you're doing even if you're lying to someone or not telling them the true information it's just mysterious like that's what Devita said it was which was something that Um, Devamrita Swami would have told him because I've listened to the Swami lectures was to just be mysterious and that's what attracts people to Krishna consciousness and that was the truth that was a message of Prabhupada to spread Krishna consciousness and this is how we do it in the modern day and age and yeah there was abuses but that's just uh, you know that's uh, I don't like I don't know what he he did kind of explain it away, but I can't remember exactly his what he said. But um, he made it sound like oh yeah that yeah that happened oh abuse yeah um, people are gonna find that out. Like he would just it was really odd how he would talk about crime and criminal activity and make it sound like it was just kind of some uh, exotic it, mystery yeah uh, or inevitable uh, part of of existing yeah like he never I didn't feel like any guilt or remorse I felt more like mockery of the act um he was almost mocking the fact that people would find out about ISKCON and that the jokes, like the whole time I, I listened to his lectures, he would always just make it feel and seem like the joke was on the person who was getting indoctrinated into the religion. And that was his whole approach. It's a very um, strange approach. Very strange. Very sh- and, 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 and problematic. It's really weird. That's like, not, they weren't nice to me, but they were nice, you know, in the, in the love bombing. And, that was like what I found super disturbing was that they had the capacity to do very um, vol like they had the capacity to put a lot of their energy and volunteering into caring for people and into spending a lot of their mm-hmm. physical and mental emotional energy. At the same time, there was something really off about it because it wasn't necessarily sincere or authentic. Even, yeah, and they would. Have of sincerity and it was real, like I kind of felt really sad for them as well because like, I thought how could you listen to this guru who's telling people to lie and you're like a nice person but you are also following you're also like you know that you're lying to people and that's not very nice to do that they all had various traumas you know I have my trauma but I got to know everyone and there were you know breakups um none of them had their family members living in Melbourne with them like Bhakti was in Bhakti's family was in France Sahail's family was in India Devija's family in India so 
you know, Jade and Sam had come to left the New South Wales, so they all were isolated, living together and even more isolated from each other, but living in the same house. You know, the Mantra Lounge people were in the Mantra Lounge house and the monks were in the, the um, temple ashram. But at the same time, like, you know, they would give lip service to submission and loving relationships. But a lot of the time I would watch people talk to each other and I didn't see any love. I, I saw very fake, almost manipulative flirtation, not really sexual flirtation, but just very, um, uh, like, put on jokes and about the devotion and, oh, this, you, you know, I'm just doing service for Krishna. And it didn't really feel like, you know, a loving relationship or loving family. Um, <laughs> Often conditional is is the word that that comes up in some of these interviews. You know, the love bombing aspect it exists as long as you remain devoted to the cause. And if you start to come across with any doubts or free thinking, it almost then turns to as you've described passive aggression or avoidance deception or attacks um, on your character you know by saying yeah. oh, oh you're not going to go to the Bhagavad Gita sessions anymore that's because you're an ungrateful person you know like you you mentioned previously well, I told him I wanted to go to the temple and then he I said you know the yeah the Bhagavad Gita classes were watered down and even like the first time I said it I said it wasn't pure enough like it wasn't like kind of deep yeah enough. so you're I trying to use nice. the right unit in, well not the right I don't know if that's that's the right diplomatic so you're, so, so you're trying to yeah. use positive terminology when you approach somebody with concerns that you have about a certain course that you no longer want to attend and and then from that you just have your character attacked uh, yeah I got criticized as being ungrateful and fickle and that I um you know if I can't commit to this, how am I going to commit to something else? So I was, it was very gaslighting and I told him that I don't want to have this conversation anymore. And then he got really angry uh, and said, oh, maybe then I'll just have to get someone else to attend and cook and volunteer. And I kind of thought this was very, he was, it was very, he was very resentful. Um, but over time, when I talked to my friend, John, who was like, friends with Hare Krishnas, but he was in a different move, like a different sect of Vaishnavism. He told me that the monk's role, which I was never told, the monk's role, Devija's role specifically, is to get people to do service. And so I only found out these things by asking people, by researching, by not talking to Hare Krishna people or talking to ex-Hare Krishna people or talking to friends of Hare Krishna people and then I realised, oh, okay, this is what's going on. They want me to just do service and then they don't want, like, people to ask lots of questions and he, um, that's not really his role. He, or, he only has limited knowledge, but he would pretend to have knowledge. And a lot of the times I would ask him questions, he would answer them quite well at the beginning and then over time, he would say, I don't know. He wouldn't say, I don't know, but he would give me very vague answers. And he would never give me a yes or no answer when I asked him, uh, am I a jnani? Like, am I a knowledge seeker? Which is the word jnana and the word for knowledge. So am I more of a knowledge person, knowledge seeking person than a bhakta, which is a de like a devotional, devotion seeking person? And he wouldn't give me a straight up answer. And so I started getting vaguer and vaguer answers as time went on. And then I brought this up with him and he had no response. And when I finally left and said I wasn't coming back regularly, which, which turned out I'd, I'd just leave permanently. So when I told him that, he actually grimaced and then he said, we're not pure devotees. And to me... It was like he was ashamed of it, but he was also laughing at it, laughing at his apparent 
um, successful attempts of deception. Like it just felt really strange the way he would laugh at the comment, we're not pure devotees, because I don't care if they're not pure. Um, but he seemed to want to give this message. And then after a few months, I saw one of their advertisements, we're not perfect. And then I just thought to myself, um, so this is this is this is what happens when you know someone brings up an issue is that they just put it into their marketing strategy to appeal to more people like that. <laughs> and the, and put, it almost feels like you can you can see them laughing at the campaign whilst it's being uploaded about the irony of them knowing that they're not authentic and and as devoted as, as possible, and that they do that on purpose and deceptively and almost like, oh, we should make a marketing campaign out of that. Like, it, it, after your story and the omission that that, that you were given yeah, I, about them not being pure devotees, it's almost like he's he that that, that campaign's like a, a slap in the face almost to the time that you had given to that movement. Yeah, and I really... And- you know, I a few months after I saw videos and they were doing the exact same thing. And uh, my friend Jen said, oh, you know, you, you took one for the team. I'm so proud of you, Michael, for confronting Devija. And I, I actually felt sick to the stomach when I spoke to him because he was forcing me to explain why I wasn't attending. Like I just said, oh, I'm not going to attend anymore. Uh, like I said it really casually. I said, oh, yeah, I'm going to do other things. And then he kept pushing me. I got really upset because I knew he was trying to, like, you know, manipulate or control my behaviour. Or, or, and, or, um, or even to do what he, think is, he thinks is best yeah. for you from what he has been taught over a very systematic period of time, through a very systematic set of, yeah, yeah. of, uh, of tools and, and time. He would quite often give advice that was not good um and he quite often said things to me like you know that these people are not like devotees michael when you're out in a work situation these people are not like devotees and he was trying to kind of imply that i could only trust devotees when i kind of was in, i felt very insulted by that comment that oh they when they're not like devotees cuz before I met the Hare Krishnas, I had already established great friendships with, you know, my friends outside of the Hare Krishna who were I would confide in and who I could respect and who respected me and we had mutual trust and very deep friendships with, with each other. And for him to say something like that, I thought it was kind of very, like, unintelligent and very ignorant of how uh, mm, people mm-hmm. can have positive experiences yeah. with there are equally nice people outside of the Hare Krishna than there are in as as much as there are inside the ISKCON religion. So the fact that he said that seemed very naive and very brainwashed. I don't know the appropriate term, but it was very naive and disturbing almost. I think yeah, it feels like the yeah the the. Like or it just yeah seems seems like the like a very out of place thing to say in that moment yeah, of time and, and in that them. environment. Yeah, because I had a bad experience with the job situation that um, Sam had helped me for one of the junior devotees living at the ashram, and I didn't um, like the job fell through, and then Devija was telling me that oh sometimes we should be more submissive and um, you know you can't. Uh, not everyone's like a devotee and uh, not everyone's as good as a devotee uh, and you know we're devotees and we're like we treat you like with this I don't know it just felt like he was preaching to me like it didn't feel like there was a genuine understanding of my situation and it kind of turned into a very senior junior relationship where he was like the senior who I needed to take instruction from without question and I was the junior who he was supposed to instruct to do service like that was kind of what it turned into when it 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 kind of I almost idolized him you know in a sense and idolized his the other um, monk there Nikeshri because he 
was interested in Carl Jung, which I was also interested in, and he read Nietzsche and well, he didn't read these, but he just knew of these authors. And he was he was a Buddhist monk before he was a Hare Krishna and he got into Judaism and I was exploring Judaism. I got into Buddhism. And he started chanting, he read the Bhagavad Gita in two weeks. So I was very inspired at the beginning, but then over time the kind of the idealization, the idolization, the um yeah, that kind of image shattered and it just became disillusionment. And uh, and I guess they kind of uh, wanted, you know, they wanted more commitment from me mm-hmm. um, and they wouldn't even say it. They wouldn't even say directly, oh, we want you to join our movement to be part of our group. We don't want you to join the temple. We want you to be part of the mantra lounge because our guru, Devamrita Swami, is telling us to do this and we want to, we believe that we're doing it the best way following Srila Prabhupada uh, and we'd like to be mysterious and not tell people what our true intention is. Like he didn't, if, at least if he said no, the truth, I would you know, have more respect for them. But the fact that they they couldn't even um, you know, they couldn't even admit to me what they were doing. I just, it was very insulting because I'm not stupid. I, I know what's going on. And they kind of, it, it's, yeah, like they kind of insult intelligence. They kind of, he even, even Devija even said to me that he believes that um, it's just nicer if someone isn't so analytical um, this is before I got I got to know him deeply, but when we just got to know each other, he told me he thinks it's nice if people are just kind of innocent and submissive, uh, and that way they just do service. So I found that kind of strange that you don't want people to have, you know, cognitive, um, you know, compet- They don't. You don't want people to have competency and com- cognitive faculties are like critical thinking mm-hmm. I well of course of course odd. that's that's a that's a <laughs> of course yeah. critical thinking is a very dangerous thing for groups like this it's very it's especially the mantra lounge because as soon as you incorporate critical thinking the sooner you decide that you're no longer going to attend any of the sessions and and that maybe that's what happened when you said I'm thinking about reducing my time in the yeah. sessions and then and then didn't return at all yes yeah, so I used to think cults were good and because they have such you know um idealistic people joining and it's so happy and the ideas are so interesting of you know love and salvation and spirituality Acceptance and community and answers yeah, I thought, to questions that everybody's had for all of time discipline and solidarity I kind of um thought that's what a cult like I knew there was criminal activity but I thought like oh maybe because they're just so amazing bad things have to happen uh like because there are they have so much potential to change the world things just inevitably terrible have to happen within the group so it's both horrible horrible and beautiful at the same time and it's it's just a more extreme ver- version of what could potentially happen in a normal person's world where they don't have like a religious practice so in this more extreme version of a religious practice you get the more extreme dark side of humanity and then you get the more extreme positive side of humanity of people making um huge social changes like that's the kind of mindset that I had thinking yeah the bad stuff is 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 allowed to happen because we have good stuff happening like that's how that's what I thought um obviously until the bad stuff starts happening to you directly and then you realize oh okay so this is not so good at all like it sounds interesting in theory on a piece of paper. Oh, yeah, the cult, you know, they opened up hundreds of temples and 
oh yeah, there was like murders and assassinations. But then when like when I got involved with them, I started to realize, oh no, like my emotions are being manipulated. My mental health is, you know, going down the drain from this. Uh, they like none of them really believed in therapy or psychology. Like I mentioned the fact that I was going to a therapist, an art therapist, and Davija said, "What?" Like he just, and I kind of he said, oh, "What for?" Like he was kind of angry, and I thought it was really odd that, um, like, what's wrong with doing therapy or even art therapy to have these like uh, conversations like about your what's going on inside your mind. And for them, like the mind is not important. It's all it's all about devotion. And the mind is not you are not the body. You are not the mind. You are the eternal soul, the eternal consciousness and servant of Krishna. That is your true identity. And that's only by realizing that, then you can overcome all of the unhappiness that comes with the flickering, fickle mind of um, only through chanting and being attentive to the name of Krishna, you can experience um, peace and suffering from mental health because all of that is ultimately unreal and the only real thing is the the true identity of the, the, the person which is bliss and happiness and being an eternal devotee of Krishna. Uh, it sounds nice in theory but it doesn't like to me at least it sounded good in theory but in practice it was actually horrible uh, with that group um, but even online like I've spoken to other ex Hare Krishnas who like are less kind of sympathetic to the movement and I've seen Hare Krishna service where people kind of uh, Hare Krishna Facebook groups where people kind of they just repeat the same philosophy and ideology and it kind of freaks me out a bit because I think oh people still believe this even though like terrible stuff happens they still truly believe in this message that Prabhupada was the final um like the greatest founder of this movement the the founder of the one of the greatest movements and the ultimate movement on the earth and he's going to you know he's going to deliver us his message and following his message to to the full degree is going to deliver us from pain and it's going to deliver us from the material suffering of this universe. Uh, people still sincerely, truly believe that he's, you know, one of the greatest um, people that have ever lived and to, to follow his instructions to a T. And I think like if he, if there are actual people who deserve that much praise, I'd, I think the world would be completely different. Um, and it's, it's, you know, there's still the issues that they talk about, they haven't really fixed them. The issues of materialism and of all of this and of violence and hatred and yeah, um, yeah. Lack of spiritual, yeah. Like it's still you no. Know, they haven't really fixed anything. They just have a very romantic vision of what happened in the past, and also like the ecstatic factors of singing happy music. It's like almost like an extreme version of going to church. Yeah, but the music and the chanting. <laughs> And yeah. the meditation and everything is is very ramped up in in terms of ISKCON in comparison to a lot of church based movements that we might discuss on the show. Yeah, so instead of you know going to church worshiping Jesus, they're you know playing drums on loudspeakers and singing Hare Krishna for hours and um, doing it like midnight sometimes. And then on like Tuesdays or Thursdays, they'll go out on the streets of like my city of Melbourne um, weekly singing and spreading this holy name of uh, Krishna, which Lord Chaitanya in the 15th century, you know, promoted. So like they have this very elaborate and articulate and romantic narrative about how this is 
this is the change that was predicted that, you know, their our gurus before Prabhupada, Prabhupada's gurus and Bhakti Siddhanta and Bhakti um, Vinoda, he said uh, that his dream is to have Western people, French and Russians, chanting the name of Hare Krishna. And because that actually came true, it was a it was kind of a a wish that he wrote about in a statement that he made in the 1800s, uh, 18 or 19, 1800s. And because that statement has come true, they believe that they're fulfilling a prophecy that, you know, what this, what our um, previous gurus in the 18th century or in the 19th century said has come true today. And what Prabhupada has done is, uh, it fulfilled that prophecy, and now we're fulfilling, and now we're the fulfillment of Prabhupada because we're following his instructions and we're going to continue this legacy. So they have a very powerful, um, empowering, strangely, in a strange kind of way, it's like a very empowering, uplifting message uh, narrative that they tell themselves and they, they talk about the. Every day they will read from the Srimad Bhagavatam and repeat these positive stories that happened hundreds and thousands of years ago from the time of Krishna, uh, the time of their their version of um, Krishna, their literal, because they believe everything happens literally in their sacred text. So they the literal existence of Krishna in, you know, 5,000 years ago, they believe that happened. They believe all of the stories of the miracles and the, the yogis who ascended into, you know, exterior realms outside of the this planet Earth. They believe this is all happening and that there were magic. They have powers of, um, you know, Ashwatthama, one of the characters in the Srimad Bhagavatam, has the power of um, creating nuclear weapons. So they believe um, this whole mystical, magical, spiritual story and that they're fulfilling it. Uh, and I've kind of researched, like, Nazi, Nazism and how other, like, um, these are more political movements, how political movements have kind of extreme ideologies or how, like, Marxist, uh, Stalin ideology they also have this, you know, very kind of to totalistic message that this is what the universe is all about and this is what happened since the beginning of time and this is going to be the ultimate fulfilment and this is how it's going to happen and this is how humankind is going to be saved and this utopian thing and where the, where the people who are following this ultimate message, this prophecy, we're fulfilling this beautiful prophecy in this this terrible land that's just horrible and sex and illicit sex and uh, like for them it's like illicit sex and homosexuality and drugs and depression we're going to change that we're going to make the world a, a wonderful beautiful place like even talking about it now I feel like um, no wonder they wanted me to keep coming to their events because I feel so passionate when I talk um, about like making positive changes in the world and about spirituality. So even when I had things to disagree with, I could like rationalize them in my mind. And then I could even give answers to people who were asking the question that I was asking. Uh, and I could give them good answers. And I was, you know, I was, they really wanted me to keep talking and I kind of didn't like that because I felt like, um, not that it was fake, but it was almost like evil. Like I felt like I wasn't um, doing something positive just by talking positively about their the Christian religion. I felt like they were more like, you know, managerial and internal issues that were going on that I wasn't talking about. I was only talking about, you know, how 
my mental health and other mental, people's mental health and, and how spirituality was so amazing and how chanting was making such a huge difference in my life and how I stopped watching porn and it was kind of like I just felt like a mouthpiece almost and I was kind of good at it. Uh, but I didn't like it. Like I didn't enjoy um, it almost it almost felt like uh, they were against capitalism or like uh, consumerism, but they were becoming and they were promoting their own version of consumerism mm-hmm. and explaining high, yeah. that away with you Spiritu- know spirituality things like well we need these new phones because it's for it's for making sure that all the the teachings and sessions run smoothly for Krishna. Yeah, it was all for Krishna. The phones are for Krishna. The laptops are for Krishna. You know, marketing on Facebook and Instagram is for Krishna and lying to people is for Krishna and not telling people that we really want disciples and, um, you know, Devija would tell me, don't don't sell books to Indians because they can just go straight to the temple. We want people to go to Mantra Lounge. Uh, so just sell it to, don't sell it to Indians. Like, it was just really weird because he was Indian himself and I just, I didn't understand the, um, like, I was trying, I couldn't understand the hypocrisy behind what he was saying until I realised that it was the um, instruction of Devamrita Swami, who is, he's very, he's actually very proud and smug about his, deliberate deception something i found really interesting that you mentioned earlier on was that the way that certain things were being explained away to you is is a, an an ideal that you almost started to adopt at that point yourself so i i've read articles around yeah. things that propupad have said publicly that have come across as problematic especially around women his thoughts around women, the LGBTQIA plus community and and people of colour. He has had some very controversial things to say about those people that you mentioned before. You kind of explained away yourself. I rationalised them, yeah. Because of the conditioning that you'd been subjected to by that point, but maybe also because Propupad was positioned to you as somebody who was the purest form of devotion to Krishna himself, themselves. I don't know if Krishna actually has a gender. Well, yeah, because of the transcendental nature of Krishna, he is beyond um, everything that's in the physical world. Mm -hmm. Like they refer to him as he, but he is non-human. He is a person, a spiritual person um, that contains um, like the, the Shakti energy, which is a female energy, and that's also a part of him. So Radha is a part of Krishna's energy. She's the pleasure principle, the pre- not the pre- pleasure principle, but the pleasure potency. And he is the kind of the, the Krishna energy. So everything is... Um, is a part of Krishna's energy and his ultimate status in the theology is is as a person, a spiritual person beyond the physical um, limitations of existence. Like he won't die, he doesn't have disease or death. He's this eternal being which light just uh, emanates from him because he's so... Uh, spiritual you also mentioned previously about giving up porn and I know that in your writing to me you talked about becoming celibate in your journey to be closer to Krishna so was that something that was encouraged or something that you independently decided to to take up on your own spiritual journey to be closer to Krishna personally so that that was definitely my personal choice but 
um, it was also, I guess it was influenced by the environment as well, because I saw that there were celibate monks or monks who said they were celibate. <laughs> I, you can't know for sure. So I, uh, to me, that was very normal, this uh, celibate asceticism life, that ascetic life that monks live, because I had um, I'd encountered Buddhist monks in uh my younger years and I had researched about that religion and about other monks. So my, I did that definitely for personal development in my relationship with Krishna, with God, with the divine. So that's, that wasn't forced upon me at all. It was more like the more, the most important thing, I think was that they just wanted to have an image uh, and they wanted people to promote their movement, their, the mantra lounge. They didn't really care so much about nitpicking um, unless it was certain rules about cleanly. Like certain people were more strict than others and other people were more, I guess, yeah, individually, there were more stricter people and then there were more practical people who just wanted to spread the movement. And then um, I was kind of not really pressured with sexuality. I actually came out to Bhakti and Devija. I said to them I was gay and they didn't have an issue with that. But I also told them, in addition to that, I said, oh, I'm planning to be celibate. Like, I am being celibate anyway. So then I guess I kind of covered myself. Did Any you, kind of sexuality is unaccepted um, right. outside of procreation in a Krishna conscious marriage between a man and a woman. I was going to say, did you feel pressured yeah. to explain how you were going to rectify the, 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 the situation of you identifying as a as a gay man did you fit did you feel like you then had they, to none of them had to none of them had an issue with that um I kind of suspected that Devija may have been gay or uh but there was no like definitive proof mm-hmm. it was only through like certain behavioral that like the way he moved or the way he would kind of um position his body and with uh Bhakti she didn't uh, she actually was fine with it. She said that that's fine. Then she actually asked me, "How did I find? When did I find out? Or how did I find out?" And I told her. So there were moments of connection between me and the disciples there because we gave, we did. I did do a lot of cooking and volunteering, especially spending time with Bhakti, who was you know running the. She was like the head chef of the place. She would never call herself that, but she was the head chef and managing them, a lot of the mantra lounge activities. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Sorry, I I sometimes get carried away or get um, sidetracked, but yeah, hopefully that answers it. Something that you spoke about briefly before was how some Hare Krishnas would take to the streets to do dancing and chanting, and I wondered if you could explain for some of the listeners some of the more traditional things that might identify Hare Krishnas for us because as somebody on the outside if you see somebody in the in the orange clothes you may associate that person with being a part of the ISKCON movement um, and certain hairstyles and, and oh, okay. so I was wondering if you could just talk through some of the identifying material that we may see on a person that helps us to understand if they are part of ISKCON and why those things exist you spoke briefly about the clay on the forehead. Yes. Um, and, and I know from your correspondence with me that you were not pressured into wearing your hair in a certain way. But could you just, yeah, talk us through all of those identifying things that, that okay. we might recognise on, on, a, on a Hare Krishna member? So I would say um, excluding the mantra lounge presentation of kind of this modern hip urban meditation community outside of that presentation excluding that I did experience these more traditional forms of Krishna consciousness um, the ISKCON religion so uh, 
when you attend the temple, um, it's customary to place the tilak, the mark of the um, the clay mark on your head, which is centered with, it's called gopi chandan, which means uh, the dirt of the gopis, um, the cowherd girls. And you place these marks on your forehead. And what they represent is um, the two lines and there's like a leaf on your your nose. And it represents Krishna's footprint and a tulsi leaf, which is Krishna's favourite leaf. So this is the mark that people place on their head. They, uh, women and men, women who use the kitchen, they wear saris, they can't wear jeans. Um, it's, for some reason, in, in, it's a rule in the kitchen. Uh, monks wear, they shave the front of their head, but at the back they leave a ponytail or like a little tail called a sikha. And that um, it's like a Vedic tradition. Um, something to do with, I didn't really research this hairstyle that much, but it's something to do with the soul leaving through the, through the top of the head or something. I can't really give too much detail on that. Sorry. So uh, men, they wear um, the orange monk clothing. I forgot the name of the, the it's, um, there's a specific Indian name. Um, and they also initiated monks. They will, when you see them without their shirt, with just the, the front, like you can see their chest, you see a white, um, a white thread called the Upanayana, Upanayana, which is the Brahmin thread that traditionally only um, birth-based Brahmins can get, but because in Hare Krishna they believe in, um, like they believe in your varna or your caste is determined by your character. So, mm -hmm. uh, if people are initiated as Bra men who are initiated, they will have this thread on them. They wear the robes on the street. They have orange saffron. They call it saffron robes rather than orange. Mm -hmm. um, I think saffron in Buddhism, saffron is a color of renunciation, <laughs> renunciation but I'm not sure in um, in Krishna Iskon. Uh, women wear saris. Generally, they cover their heads inside the temple. It's not really. Um, some places are stricter than others. I noticed that with the Iskon temple in Melbourne, people don't really dictate how other. They don't really care about the clothing of other people. Because of this, um, I guess it's called Hinduization. They, you have, you know, the Indian young Indians wearing jeans, and you have people with longer hair. Um, mm. people, uh, cleanliness is important, so they always shave their heads. But the monks they shower twice a day. They, um, they wear the saffron. They sometimes they go out in plain clothing. They wear the, they wear traditionally they wear the um, the tilak, and the women wear saris, especially on the Tuesdays when they go out to do the chanting. They have little um, symbols called cartels, and these symbols um, make a very distinct like ching ching ching. That is a special rhythm. Mm, that, right. Uh, yeah. 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 So they they use harmoniums. They chant. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Like it's a very distinctive and it's very loud and boisterous and exciting and ecstatic, uh, rhythmic. And the sound of the harmonium is very, it has that very kind of, like a kind of very droney, like cultural sound to it. It's originally from Germany, but it was popularized. In, it became popular in Indian devotional music. It always reminds me of the George Harrison My Sweet Lord song. Yes, but that song is also a collaboration with Iskon. He never fully devoted himself to the religion, but he became close with the founder. He donated a temple, the Bhaktivedanta Manor of London, to Prabhupada, was like a few thousand, hundred thousand dollars, and he just gave it to them. Wow. Uh, he was also affiliated with Ra Ramana. I don't know if it was Romana Maharishi, but he was affiliated with the TM. Should, um, I don't know what the, yeah, something called TM, Transcendental Meditation, that's it. Mm 
Okay. That, the person who created that. And Vimana is a yeah. significant figure in, in Hinduism. Is, is, that, is that right? Am I getting that right? Yeah. Uh, the, the person who created Transcendental Meditation uh, popularized, I guess, um, ch- the chanting of mantras, similar to Iskon, but without the whole uh, the Vaishnavism aspect. It was more like a secular version of chanting you, and promoted as some kind of science, which Iskon also does. They promote their ideas as science. So that's he. He brought like an Indian tradition and westernized it to, and brought it to the hippies, and it became very popular. I don't know right. how big it became. So but when you he, talk yeah. of Vaishnavism, yeah, I've I've just had a a quick Google here, and it says that Vamana was the fifth of ten incarnations or avatars oh, of the of the oh, Hindu oh. god Vishnu. <laughs> just going to say that I know that, that that Vishnu is something to do with the ISKCON movement and the controversy ah. around the, the belief system of of, uh, of of Hare Krishna as as a venerated figure yeah so I also spent some time researching this and the answer is kind of weird but traditionally Hindus believe that Vishnu is the the primary avatar from which Krishna is the like an eighth avatar. So Vishnu is the avatari, which is the source of all avatars, and Krishna is the eighth incarnation. This is not shared with the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. They don't believe this. Um, they believe that Krishna is the supreme, and they use their uh, scriptures, the Gopala Tarini, the Gopala Upanishad. Uh, which is um, scholars believe that was written later or it was interpolated. And then they also, but they believe this is an authentic, this is like the earliest Upanishad. It's, they believe it's a Veda. It's part of the Vedas. They also believe that um, they use the scripture in the Srimad Bhagavatam to prove that Hari, Krishna, he is, the name Hari is also another name for Krishna, that he is the source. And that everything that refers to Vishnu or Narayana or all of these other names like Ram, Rama, they're manifestations of Krishna and he is the source. So Vishnu is actually uh, Mm -hmm. a part of Krishna, but Krishna is the source of Vishnu. He's the source of Radha and all of of Shiva, Mm -hmm. of all all of the deities of um, yeah, that's exactly that's exactly yeah. what I was when you said the word Vamana, yeah. I was thinking, I know that sounds familiar and I can't remember why. And then it comes back to the the 10 avatars, which you've just explained to everybody, um, which I maybe should have prompted at the start of the episode. But hopefully if anybody listening uh, can kind okay. of work out the significance of Hare Krishna inside those 10 avatars. And that's kind of where... Uh, Chaitana's kind of looked at that and said, actually, do you know what? Looking at all of this, Hare Krishna is the one that we should be focusing on as the true deity out of all of these different reincarnations. Um, I guess yeah. it's kind of what I was thinking at the start of the episode. But there are a few things that that I've read in terms of accusations towards ISKCON or certain pressures that people felt being involved in the movement. And I just wanted to ask you if you'd ever experienced certain things. So did you ever live in any Hare, Hare Krishna lodgings or were you encouraged to? Because I've, I've read a few things around people basically being asked to separate their life from their family and friends and and move into lodgings closer to the temple because it's more convenient and then more and more and more of their time becomes taken up in temple activities and chanting and meditation sessions and 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 all the rest of the stuff that you've discussed today so their method was very interesting rather than discouraging people they would say relationships are very important, but this is, you know, another one of those things where they do, they pay lip service to the idea of relationships, but they don't actually know how to involve themselves in healthy relationships. So they, right. they were talking about par- in the importance of parents and the importance of being a role model, of, of being a symbol for Krishna consciousness to people 
and that you can take, you can um, give your association, you can give people Krishna consciousness, but if they're not a Krishna conscious person, they're a karmi, then you don't take their association. So you give, but you don't take. And it was all about this kind of, this balancing act of, for me, like it felt like almost um, wanting them to join your religion and just being very nice to them so they could join. And everything else that takes your time, then you just reduce it. So I was encouraged to reduce less important interactions, but it was um, it was framed in a way that it was like, oh, this is going to, this is like as a mentor, it's okay. kind of for your spiritual development and um, this is all for Krishna consciousness that when you talk less to, um, and I was actually seeking advice as well. So it kind of, the relationship functioned in this kind of power dynamic where I would submit and then the monk that I was seeking advice from would give me advice and I was expected to follow it because when I didn't uh, or when I criticised it or questioned it, then I would get, um, I would, you know, I would receive microaggressions. Mm, and have and your have, character attacked. Yeah, yeah, I would have my character assassinated. So. Something else you mentioned in your correspondence to me that I just wanted to highlight was some allegations of abuse within the section of ISKCON that you were involved in, and that was around children and urine and sexual abuse. And I didn't know if you could talk the listeners through what you meant by those things specifically. Uh, sure. Um, so... I don't have any knowledge on the guru calls in Melbourne. Like it's not the the schools are quite unofficial, so it's not they're not advertised as Krishna conscious schools. I think one of them was shut down because they didn't have enough funding in in New South Wales. But uh, there is a history of abuse, especially in the guru calls, the special um, schools for Krishna conscious children in India and also in, I guess, early um, West Virginia when it was kind of during the Kirtan and under period, there was a lot of abuse. And in, so I the knowledge that I received was through documentaries about children's personal experiences um, spoken about when as they were adults. So uh, there, yes, there was uh, urine people, uh, the kids who, I don't, this is not in relation to the Melbourne Temple. Uh, the kids, they were like American kids. So these American kids would talk about, um, well, the adults would talk about the experiences of children when they would oversleep. They would have, um, if they peed in their pants, for example, they would have to wear their. Um, they would have to wear, put on their sleeping bags that were wet. Oh, uh, one kid said he got anally raped. Uh, this is like really graphic, <laughs> but um, sorry about the details. But yeah, one person said he was anally raped. Uh, another. You know, a girl said that she was exploring um, because she was so depressed that the girls, and they were being sexualized at such a young age, as little girls they were doing experimentation um, with other girls. So they were engaging in um, homosexual activity as children because they were being exposed to sexual abuse but from adults. Uh, and then... Like some of the stuff was is was really out there. Like someone wanted uh, jumped off, uh, almost jumped off a, a a window, and nobody said anything to him. The kids in um, there were kids in India who were um, suffering from diseases because there was malnutrition. There were cockroaches in the food. Uh, and the most recent, this you know, this happened more in the eighties, prominently um, 
exposed as happening in the 80s, but it's still a lot of the stuff happens today, for example, like Bhakti Vijapurna Swami, he has hit children and abused them. Uh, Lokanath Swami has sexually touched, like he sexually harassed a girl, touching her vagina or um, the front, like while her pants were still covering her clothes, like her body. And he's, he's still being worshipped and venerated today. He's still singing kirtans. Bhaktavidji Purnaswami, who's abused boys in the group, uh, physically abused boys in the Gurukuls um, in India, he's actually visited Sydney. I've seen his video. I was actually quite disturbed that they would let in people like this because there's, ev- there's evidence against them. Yeah, absolutely. And yep, yep. It was very, very disturbing. And I guess it's like, you know, Tom Cruise advertising Scientology. You think. Uh, you think um, people have a sense of, you know, discernment about who they promote and who they bring on to their shows, but or who they, the type of religions they talk about. Uh, but that's not the case, you know. Tom Cruise, yes, he's um, he's a spokesperson for Scientology, and he truly believes in it. And then you have these Hare Krishna temples who bring in, you know, child abusers to the temples and they they speak and give lectures. And then in India you have, you know, child abusers, child molesters who initiate disciples. <laughs> so it's just... Uh, what you right- said about being surprised that these people are invited into certain countries or invited yeah. to visit to give motivational speeches or to make appearances and, yeah. and, 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 and to give lectures and to bolster attendance numbers for certain events. It is surprising that you say that because just t- to type ISKCON child abuse into Google brings up krishna.org, iskontruth.com, iskonchildprotection.org, iskonnews.org, New York Times, articles around the Hare Krishna movement details past abuse at its boarding schools you there's so much in just typing that which which is not very common really amongst groups that have been labeled cults it's not sometimes the browsers that sometimes the search engines are scrubbed of negative articles or negative headlines or negative websites or People pay for promotions to have their very positive reviews and very positive websites of certain movements and sects to feature way, way, way above in the first kind of first, second, third, fourth, fifth pages of Google. I mean, I don't know if I've ever been to the fifth that's, page of that's Google. What happened with, that's what happened with Radhana Swami because he was associated and implicated in the murder of Salochana Das as a, as like a, um, you know, a person who associated with, who planned the assassination, he, uh, an accomplice, and he, uh, because there was so much negative information, he paid a PR team thousands of dollars to promote uh, his positive, like positive uh, information and lectures. And now when you type his name in, Radhana Swami, you don't see anything about the murders of Salochana. You, know, you see all so of his talks. Yeah, a perfect at example. Google, at TED with other, you know, with other priests from other religions, with the Dalai Lama, with, you know, um, his his disciples, uh, I can't remember her name, uh, Janavi, who's done music with Willow Smith. You see Will Smith, who talks about the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> it's actually very clever that what they're doing to clean up their image. They're still the same uh, cult, but it's the... Um, the image is different. The presentation is different. So it's more how, like an urban, urban yoga thing now. How was it that, because you've mentioned that you decided that you were going to reduce your time within the lessons and teachings and, and, and oh. sessions that you were attending, but but how was it that you finally like how why when did you when did you leave as we go into the last couple of questions of the interview? I left in March, two thousand and twenty-one. 
and and it was it was a seamless transition from attending to not attending where you kind of asked to come back at all where you're encouraged to continue trying to I was be... contacted after telling them telling Devija that I was just busy mm-hmm. and then I also stopped going to the temple because I noticed that um Devon Rita Swami had told Devija to kind of shun me from the temple because I noticed the security guard was looking at me um strangely and I also found out later that he that people who were associating with other groups like the Gaudium Math group, they were also being stared down by the security when they went when they went inside the temple. So um it was a very uncomfortable transition to be honest. They would call me, I would not respond, and then I saw messages on my phone. Uh I did initially say that I was just going to do something else and be with other people. And then I would get passive aggressive comments like, oh, you're free to do whatever you want. And I didn't feel like that was very, there was no sincerity in that. There was just kind of some kind of resentful uh, lack of like transparency, to be honest. Uh, Like it was like a strange sincerity. I don't know what to call it, but this would happen, like a lot of uncomfortable reactions, like the hysterical reaction from Bhakti about, oh, you're joining this person and that person. And then David is saying, oh, you're free to do whatever like you want. And Right. Kind of like whiplash. You didn't really know which, which way to go. Kind of one person says one thing, one says another. And then like Jane would say, oh, are you joining? Are you coming back to the, the, uh, the Nectar of Devotion class? And I was really uncomfortable because I didn't want him to know that. I didn't, and also I didn't feel like it was in his place to tell me if, like, if I leave something, why are you telling me to join it again? Especially when I said the reason why I was leaving. So then, you know, Devija would ask me, even after I told him that I wasn't regularly going, because I didn't say I'm going to stop permanently, I said I would stop doing things that you tell me to do because. I feel like I have to follow it. I will just do what I think is right for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't even say I was going to stop completely. I just said I was. I will do. I will go if I decide to go, not if you expect me to go. And I don't think he was happy with that. Um, but then he did contact me again to go to further events. But I did, um, like, he contacted me to go to some kind of camp. And I was just very over it and sceptical. And yeah. uh, after that, I just blocked all of their numbers. Okay. Because um, I didn't want people to be, them to contact me at all. Like, I just had to, like, detox. Uh, it was very painful, but I, it's still very, like, kind of painful now. So, yeah, like, I just had to detox and not, you know, talk to any of them again. I think that's a common a common thing that's that's talked about on this show that some of the some of the ways that people have left their movements have been through just going no contact and and having that time away from the group to formulate your own thoughts and ideas and to get a good night's sleep and a good meal and a good rest and to formulate small ideas that you've had into full-on streams of consciousness that that maybe hadn't had the chance to develop because you you you, you'd been involved in in very systematic control methods Uh, so the fact that you said there that you just needed to detox which was painful but it was something that you needed to do in order to break away from the group is is something very poignant that we should take away from this episode in terms of what people can do for themselves if they are in similar positions and thinking about taking a step back from their high demand group understand that that, that it may be painful but know that other people have been through the process and uh, it it can be successful yeah I am lucky because my housemate is really supportive I didn't really have massive conversations to her about my religious experiences but 
I invited her to one event. Um, she wasn't interested in the next, the future ones. But like she gave, like I, you know, get. Um, she supports me while I live here. She offered me like to a place to stay when I was struggling. Uh, and like rent wise, I pay less than um, like the full amount of rent. So she's been really helpful. That's fantastic. And Thank you so much for your support and your help. <laughs> yeah. So having, you know, people who support you does help. And I kind of understand why someone would join a cult because uh, I was in that situation. Curiosity is one thing, but then also lacking like positive relationships. Like for me, it's estrangement from family, um, sexual abuse in the um, like when I was younger. Mm-hmm. So having negative uh, trauma, like having traumatic experiences, will lead people more closely into joining making decisions like joining a cult absolutely yeah if they have psychological difficulties anxiety depression Mm -hmm. mental health problems you know for me like I still struggle like it's not I'm not perfectly sane in my mental health I'm not perfectly happy but I do try to um, keep myself uh, doing things that are healthy for me and that don't involve these extreme you know, methods, because I can be a very extreme person. So I'm very aware now that to take a step back before I do something like the Krishna thing. And (laughs) something that you have done since leaving ISKCON is that you've gone on to read and research and educate yourself on the practice, on the different different belief systems in place within ISKCON in on the history you've given yourself such a vast amount of information to process the experience that you've had but also the the text the Bhagavad Gita and and, and every, everything around that that is used within this movement you've gone away and you've done all of that independent research to make sense of it yourself and also understand it on a deeper level away from the ashrams and the temples and the gurus and the monks and and, and all of the ISKCON hierarchy and, and labels yeah. and system, but you've, all, you, you've, you've still been able to give us an in-depth insight into that knowledge that you gained primarily after you'd left the group, which says a lot about the teachings that the group gave you whilst you attended but also on your ability to be a critical thinker, to have the forethought to move yourself away from this group and cut off all contact. And then also say, I'm still interested in either what the group was trying to accomplish with me as a member or what the group intrinsically believes in. And I will understand that if I do independent research on my own terms, in my own time, in my own space, in my own environment. And now you've been able to come here and give us all of that information alongside the experiences that you had around, primarily around the Mantra Lounge, which may not transpire with other ex-ISCON members who are listening, who have had slightly different experiences, who live in different parts of the world. But as you mentioned at the start of the episode, certain groups within ISCON may be more cult-like than others. And this is a great example of those cult-like methods of control and coercion, manipulation and undue influence that are given or put on certain members within the Mantra Lounge itself as a, as, as almost a separate sect of, of ISKCON. Uh, so it's almost like you've got kind of Hinduism as an umbrella and the Hare Krishna movement as one sect of that umbrella. And then almost arguably the Mantra Lounge as a separate tangent to ISKCON yeah. overall it, it feels it like they're, they're trying to kind of make their own footing in the environment of of ISKCON and the space of of the Hare Krishna movement um but what I wanted to ask before we finish today was about advice that you would give to others who may be in similar situations who are thinking of moving away I know there is the text killing for Krishna that you mentioned before we hit the record button that is yeah. a text that has been recommended to me for some reading for research and resource material 
But apart from the Killing for Krishna book, is there anything else that you might recommend for people who are looking to do what you have done with moving away from from this particular kind of movement? So for people specifically to understand just what's going on with the Krishna thing, the Krishna cult, the Krishna religion, I think people, uh, I would recommend a book by Nicole Karapanagiotis, I think that's her surname, called Branding Bhakti, because it goes into Radhanath Swami's movement, um, Hridayananda Goswami's movement, and Devamrita Swami's mantra lounge, and how they present um, the Krishna religion, how they market it to people in the modern day and age. It's written by a, an academic, a scholar of religion, and she actually joins the, the people. She joins them um, and they know what she's doing and she does volunteering and she analyzes and writes about how uh, Krishna consciousness is marketed to Indians, how it's marketed to Westerners, how its um, theology is being applied today. There's another book called... Um, by Brian Edwin, uh, Edwin Bryant. I can't remember the name. I think it's the Harry Krishna movement. I can't, not too sure. There's a there's a series of essays in that. I haven't read that, um, but I know I've, I've taken classes with Edwin Bryant, who used to be Harry Krishna, but he's now Gaudiya Gaudiya Mat. Um, it's like a different sect of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And then there's the uh, other than Killing, Killing for Krishna by Henry Doktorsky, which I highly recommend because it's factual. I don't recommend um, Monkey on a Stick because it's semi-fictional. There's, it's based on uh, fact, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of their information was added in for dramatic effect. And mm -hmm. dialogues were placed that don't actually, that never actually happened. So I don't recommend that. Um, it's more of a sensationalist uh, semi-fiction book. And then there's uh, 11 Naked Emperors, which is a book by Henry Doktorsky as well. And it goes into the GBC period and the, the kind of the political dramas that happened between the senior, the senior disciples of Prabhupada, how the movement kind of deteriorated and, and how it's being perceived within the, the, the religious movement today and how kind of, uh, the interaction between ex-cult leaders and, co and current cult leaders and then um, the conservative elements and liberal elements and elements that think that they were heretical and elements I think they did a lot of great things. It's a very kind of well-rounded book that explores multiple perspectives and I highly recommend it. Um, I kind of read it, tried to read it like through it quickly like because I was kind of doing a little um, you know, game of, oh, like just read as much as I can within a few days. It's like a little competition. So I don't recommend doing like a speed read. Like there's a lot of dense information. So it's good for people who want to understand like more the political side, that, that particular book, The Eleven Naked Emperors. Fantastic. That's great. Thank yeah. you so much for giving us such an extensive list of resources to, to go and look at if it's something that people feel is needed for them personally. I really appreciate your time today, Michael, for giving us such an insightful and extensive introduction to the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, not just from your personal stance, but also from a historical stance and a philosophical stance and a psychological stance too. I think it's going to be a very interesting episode for people who listen all the way through in understanding how the Eastern philosophies and mysticism that you were interested in whilst when you were younger influenced and impacted your decisions to be included in the Hare Krishna movement when you were older, but also why it no longer became something that you were interested in pursuing when the high demand, manipulation, coercion and undue influence started to take its toll on you as an individual. And I think that speaks volumes to people who 
may have also decided independently to, you know, contact a movement or phone phone up a movement or go and attend a session, you know, or maybe people who weren't born into movements feel more responsibility or guilt on themselves for making that independent decision to go and be part of a, a movement. But what you've told us today is that people can it, you, people can be successful in cutting off contact, in taking that space away from a certain group, researching and understanding intrinsically the belief system and practices in place for that group, but also the all the other side of of the commentary that comes with it, the salacious uh, headlines that come from articles that label certain movements, cults and sects and groups that use manipulation and abuse as, as tools of control. And I think you've given a very wide variety for people to walk away with today and consider in terms of what they consider cults or what they consider their time spent in certain movements to equate to. And, and that's really important. So I just want to say a massive thank you for your time today, Michael. A massive thank you to your flatmate, housemate as well, for being supportive yeah, you. of you yeah. uh, and your and your transition out of this group. And uh, hopefully some people can take some positive messages from this and, and understand that even if they have independently contacted or walked into a movement's environment and become more and more involved over time through certain tools of coercion that there are ways to rectify that situation and that the certain individual themselves is not to blame so thank you so much for your time today Michael I know it's very early where you are so I can let you go yeah. and get some sleep at some point so thank you so much for your for your time today. And I really hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time you spent with me and the fantastic questions. And I hope anyone who um, listens to this uh, is offered with the information that is necessary for them to make an informed decision. And uh, hopefully it was very entertaining and interesting for um everyone listening so thank you so much for this opportunity thanks michael take care yeah. i'll speak to you soon okay see you casey bye that is the end of this week's episode if you'd like to get in touch you can find me at coltboltpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on twitter and instagram at coltboltpod i'm your speaker casey and this has been the cult vault <laughs>